right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's seminar. I'm Patrick, your host. Uh, so tonight, we will be going over strategies for the Common Application. So those of you not familiar, the Common App is the main application system that you're going to be using uh, for the vast majority of your private schools and quite a few public universities as well. So let's get right into it. So first of all, before we jump into the nuances of the Common App, I kind of want to explore the current landscape of competitive college admissions. As you well know, you know, colleges have gotten even harder, especially post-COVID, as more and more people are applying to the same top colleges, right? So many people, when they think of the top universities across the U.S., they think of a list kind of similar to this, which is the most recent U.S. news rankings until at least the end of the month, right? So the 2025 rankings will be released, uh, I think, September 24th. So if you join us for a future seminar, you will see the updated list. But as of right now, these are some of the most familiar names, right? Princeton has been number one for over a decade now. Uh, some other schools that you're going to see here that are very familiar, Harvard and Stanford, of course, in the top three-ish, they're tied for number three. Um, but yeah, so pretty much all the Ivies here, with the exception of Dartmouth, I believe, just didn't make the cut here in terms of the top 12. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of representation here. Many of the schools that you heard me talk about last uh, Friday, the IB Plus schools are definitely in the mix here as well. You see MIT, Stanford, Caltech, Hopkins, Northwestern, and Chicago, right? So those are some of the same top colleges that most people are familiar with. However, uh, there's also another rankings list of a different kind of colleges that some, some uh, students and parents are not as familiar with. And I do want to talk about those a little bit, right? These are called the liberal arts colleges, right? So I think there's a lot of common misconceptions as to what a liberal arts college is. But let's maybe take a look to try to see some of the familiar names that pop in here. Um, some of the top ones you're probably familiar with, right? So uh, colleges like Williams College in Massachusetts or Amherst, also in Massachusetts, are very famous at this point. Uh, Pomona College, if you're in Southern California, you're very familiar with this. Uh, Swarthmore is in Pennsylvania. It's actually in a suburb of Philadelphia, right? Uh, along with Wellesley, which is an all-female college, also in Massachusetts, very popular and very competitive, right? Uh, and you'll also note here that the three service academies are listed here because not only are they, of course, very hard to get into because of all the military, uh, uh, I guess, requirements or the physical requirements, right? Uh, they're also very academically uh, solid, right? Because you know, for you to go into the Navy or the Air Force, you need a top uh, top tier STEM education, right? So that's why they're very highly ranked here as well. Uh, some of the names further down the list you may not be as familiar with, names like Bowdoin College um, or Carleton College, for instance, are a little bit less familiar to most people, right? But they're still top colleges nonetheless, and they will typically occupy the top 10 or top 15 lists of U.S. News as liberal arts lists, okay? So some things to note for liberal arts colleges. First of all, um, liberal arts, by the way, is just a distinction that generally means that there's no graduate school there. Uh, some of you might be surprised to find out that liberal arts colleges actually have just as broad a range uh, in some cases as like many smaller colleges or, or big research universities. So that's definitely one of the main distinctions. So some of these schools, for instance, like Swarthmore actually has a computer science and engineering program. Right. So Carlton, very strong in the sciences, as is Pomona. So it's definitely something that if you've only been fixated on these big national research universities, uh, perhaps you're missing out potentially on some of the advantages of applying to a liberal arts college. So some of the things that I, I see as advantages to going to a liberal arts college is that you do tend to get stronger recommendation letters, more personalized. Um, of course, I've seen this firsthand. Right. Um, I actually got a chance to work in Harvard's graduate school admissions office, and I was able to see the quality of the recommendation letters that come from liberal arts professors uh, and instructors. There's a lot more nuance and there's a lot more attention being placed because you get to know your professors better in a smaller college. So that's certainly an advantage to it. Now, of course, on the flip side, you may not necessarily get uh, big celebrity professors in their fields, right, because most of those professors tend to gravitate towards like research universities, right? Um, as I said earlier, many of these liberal arts colleges will have a pretty decently broad range of majors. So if you're thinking of a, a major that's a pretty standard major in most colleges, like if you're thinking of like psychology or thinking of an English major, and in some cases, even computer science, you're actually going to be pretty well served attending a liberal arts college. 
However, if you're going for something that's a little bit more niche or very interdisciplinary, like you're thinking of a major, like let's say, um, let's see, computational biology, that's going to be very hard to get at a liberal arts college, right? So you're better served going to a larger research university in that case, right? Um, also, um, liberal arts colleges tend to make for very good preparation for graduate schools because they are oftentimes very focused on undergrad education, right? So most professors who, who uh, teach at a liberal arts college will tend to do so with the intent of focusing on undergraduate teaching, not so much research. So if you feel like you'd rather have a smaller, more intimate uh, learning environment and you learn better by having a little bit more focus and discussion with both your peers and the professor, then a liberal arts college could actually be an outstanding preparation for graduate school. And in my experience, uh, having seen things from let's say Harvard's graduate admissions office, um, there's not really any sort of decided difference in terms of the academic rigor involved between like, let's say if you attended Swarthmore or Carleton versus if you attended like a UPenn in the eyes of a graduate school admissions office, at least a top caliber one, right? So that's definitely something to consider. You're not in any sort of decided disadvantage, right? Now, of course, you know, if what you want to study is very research intensive, then if, that's probably one of the trade-offs where it'd make more sense to go to a larger research institution rather than a smaller liberal arts college, okay? Um, another thing that's often highly underrated are public universities, okay? State schools oftentimes get like a little bit of a rap because they may not be as prestigious or, or kind of like fancy as some of these Ivy League type schools, but oftentimes you get a tremendous value for your tuition, right? Uh, so many of these schools like UC Berkeley, UCLA, um, especially if you're a California resident, the tuition is oftentimes going to be less than half of what you would pay for one of these preeminent private universities, okay? And oftentimes, if you're going to be going for fields like engineering or computer science, a school like Berkeley or UCLA will probably be just as good, maybe even better than some of these schools on this national universities list, okay? All right, so um, what about out-of-state public universities? What are the benefits here? As I mentioned, there are many public universities, especially the flagship campuses of many research universities, tend to actually be very outstanding for fields like computer science, engineering, or business, because the state governments know that that's where the jobs are, right? So they devote a lot of resources to make sure that their states excel at training their state residents to be very, very good at those fields, right? So um, one of the things to keep, uh, keep in mind here is that many big public state universities might actually be very well ranked for your specific major, but you can also benefit from maybe a, a, a better acceptance rate than if you were trying to apply to, you know, uh, an Ivy level or top 15, top 20, you know, main research university. Okay. Uh, the tuition in many cases will often be cheaper, especially if you're a state resident. Okay. Now, even if you weren't a state resident, I would say the tuition would probably fall in between what you would pay for an in-state tuition versus what you would pay for, let's say, um, you know, a private research university. So it'll probably fall somewhere in the middle there. So it's still a, a good value, of course, not as good as if you're a resident, okay? One of the things to keep in mind too is that if your family moved to the state where you're gonna be attending for public university in about a year or two, depending on the state's regulations or the, the school systems, uh, uh, I guess, guidelines, you could actually be able to get state tuition eventually, right? That's something to consider as well down the line. Uh, and of course, networking universities, many public universities tend to be located in the big metropolitan areas of many of these states. So there could be good opportunities for you to network, get internships, be like very well connected in terms of the job market, okay? All right, so uh, how competitive are some of the top schools in the country these days? Have, have things changed? Well, what we've noticed actually is because there was a massive spike in terms of the number of applicants during the COVID era, right? Um, what ended up happening is that since those acceptance rates plummeted tremendously, uh, there's kind of been a little bit of a rebound in some schools. You'll notice, by the way, schools like Harvard and Brown, ever so slightly, their acceptance rate over the last two or three years has actually been increasing. Now, this is not necessarily a static trend. As you can see, like Yale uh, and UPenn actually have an opposite trend. So it's sort of kind of fluctuating a little bit, you know, some up, some down. So that's actually kind of good news, right? So we don't anticipate major drops um, because there's not really going to be an impetus for like a massive increase in the number of applications unless we had, a, we had another major life-altering event like, you know, another pandemic. Hopefully not, right? Uh, so that's a good sign, I guess, for future applicant 
uh, classes that you know you're not necessarily going to see massive drop offs at the acceptance rates for all the top colleges, right? It'll it'll kind of vary a little bit though. Okay. All right. So let's see. Uh, selected private schools, other than the Ivies, which is what I showed you, also see a slight decrease if you're going down the the trend lists here, right? So um, you know, schools like Boston College went down about a percent. Some schools didn't really change all that much. Like MIT has remained more or less in that kind of like between four to five percent range. Uh, some even went up slightly, actually, right? But kind of similar to the Ivies, there's not really a major trend here of the acceptance rates decreasing significantly anymore like they did in the past three to four years. Okay. All right. Um, let's continue. So now to the common app page, right? So now we're going to be talking about the common application itself. All right. So let's kind of dive deeper into it. So the first thing I want to talk about is the timeline for the common application. What uh, is the time frame for you to submit these applications? So first and foremost, August 1 came and, got, uh, came and went already. Uh, the Common App becomes live, so to speak, on August 1st. What that means is that during the summer for a couple of weeks, they basically take it offline, right? Uh, which means you're no longer able to access it for a couple of, uh, couple of weeks. Uh, now, uh, during that time, uh, yeah, so during that time, it goes offline, you can't access it, but August 1st comes along, and they basically just do maintenance and update the actual application itself. Um, so at that time, you would then be able to access all the different applications and, and be able to find the supplements for that particular year. Okay, next. Uh, on November 1st, uh, this is going to be the deadline for most early action and early decision applications. So if you're thinking of applying early action or early decision to any of your schools, uh, the majority of them will be due November 1st. There are a couple of notable um, exceptions to this. So like University of North Carolina, for example, has an October 15th deadline. Um, the uh, UT Austin, right? University of Texas at Austin also has an October 15th deadline. Um, now, beyond that, you know, the vast majority of other schools will have a November 1st deadline, okay? Uh, next, uh, November 15th is the actual deadline for University of Washington, and this is for regular decision, okay? So just be very aware of this. This is not an early deadline. This is actually the regular deadline across the board, right? So um, keep in mind, uh, uh, because many students assume that most schools will be due around like January 1st. So if you miss that deadline, you cannot be considered anymore for University of Washington. Now, uh, fortunately, many of the schools that you did apply to for early decision will release their decision uh, around mid-December, I would say, right? So anywhere from as early as maybe December 8th or 9th for the earliest, all the way up to about December 20. Some even come out right before Christmas, to be honest, right? I've heard of some schools releasing their decision around December 22nd, December 23rd. Okay? And of course, that's going to be really helpful because if you get the decision during that time, you can then make any sort of necessary adjustments to your college list. If you got accepted for ED, of course, then you're done, right? So you don't have to worry about applying to any other schools because you're in, okay? Now, for some other schools, if you didn't get into your EA, for example, you can hear back from, uh, or your ED, rather, uh, you can hear back from some of your early action schools, in which case, if you got into some, you may not need as many safety schools. So that's definitely a plus for having, you know, more than one school that you apply to for early action, Okay. All right, next is from January 1st to 8th, around that range, uh, is usually the deadline for most regular decision schools. Uh, now, some would even be later, right? I've seen some schools that are due even as late as January 15th, uh, or some even like February 1st. There are going to be some schools that accept even all the way until June, but oftentimes those are going to be most likely your safeties, right? Schools that also have what's called rolling admissions, where they'll just make a decision within two to three weeks of receiving your application. So for the most part, though, the vast majority of your schools should let you know around March to April. This is the time frame by which they, they start kind of like revealing uh, whether or not you got in or not. Okay. And you will then have until about May 1st to make a decision as to whether or not you want to attend the school. You will have to send in what's called your statement of intent to register at that point. Okay. Next up. Uh, why is it uh, important to submit your application early? 
Okay, well, at HS2, we normally recommend that you submit your application within two to four weeks of any college deadline. Uh, and we found over the years, this is really important for some reasons, right? So the first of which is it sends a signal that you're organized and that you're not a procrastinator, right? Very important. Uh, keep in mind that the admissions people have a timestamp for when they download your application, so they know when you submitted it. So it's not going to be a good look if all of a sudden you're trying to submit it on the evening of the deadline at around like 11 p.m., right? So that's definitely not something that would portray you in a very favorable light, a favorable light for the admissions people. Next is it also gives you a window of about two to three weeks during which the admissions people are in the office already, most likely getting ready for their very busy application cycle, right? And there's a huge workload that they know they're going to anticipate after the deadline, right? But in some cases, not all though, but in some cases, uh, some admissions offices can start reading the applications early, right? So as long as they've already gotten a chance to see that there's some applications in the system, you can try to get a head start. They won't always say they do though, but that that's definitely something that I've heard from some offices where they do, uh, you know, get an early jump, I guess, in terms of reading the applications themselves. So just be aware of it, okay? And then lastly, another advantage of getting your application early is that it gives a chance for uh, your application to make it to the interview chairs who then distribute it to the local alumni interviewers, right? So if a school were to have an interview as part of their system, um, it definitely helps that you get your application in there in a timely fashion because uh, it, def it definitely gives you a better shot to get an interview. That's one of those like secrets that I guess a lot of people aren't aware of um, that you know many interviews are basically kind of like on a first come first serve basis, right? So many times I hear like students basically saying like, I don't get it. Like, why did my friend get an interview and I didn't, right? And they assume that maybe they're much more interested in their friend at school rather than their application and get they get really paranoid, right? So it could just be actually that your friend just submitted their application earlier, right? So just keep that in mind. Next, uh, what's the ideal number of college applications, right? So I just want to disclaimer everything before I jump into these talking points here that the common application does have a limit of 20 colleges, right? That's how many you can enter in into the dashboard. Uh, and you can't add any more past that point, right? So it's important to re remember that. Uh, so when you're deciding then, it's important to consider some things, right? So applying to too many schools will actually potentially dilute the quality of your efforts in writing compelling essays. So unless you started way early, it's definitely not a good idea to go ahead and have way too many schools because for some students, it just compounds your stress. It makes it harder for you to focus on certain schools. So definitely want to consider, you know, paring it down to a reasonable number if you think you can't finish all the work. Uh, next, uh, you may also need to do things like interviews and visits, which could be more demanding on your schedule if you had too many colleges, right? Um, honestly, it may end up even annoying your school counselor, right, who still needs to kind of like do things like send paperwork and stuff to these schools. Um, some schools even cap, right? I've heard of some high schools that actually cap the number of schools they allow you to apply to. So you definitely want to check on that. Though we normally recommend having anywhere between 12 to 15 schools, right? So if you're applying to like a system like the, the University of California, for instance, for UCs, that, you know, you can count that as just one school technically because you're doing the same work for, you know, if you're applying to Berkeley as if you would apply to all the UCs, right? So you do want to make sure you have a good distribution in terms of the number of colleges that you're trying for. So we want to make sure that you have ample reach schools, target schools, and safety schools in the mix as well. So you know, don't be too top heavy either. Don't have like 10 read schools and only two, like one target school and one safety school, because then you're not going to like the results most likely, right? So you really want to have a balanced list because ideally in the best case scenario, you're getting into about maybe half of the schools on that list, right? Because if you applied to like a certain number of schools and you got into all of them, either you're really, really lucky, which is good, or you were just maybe too complacent, but you weren't trying to go beyond and try your chances for some really competitive schools or vice versa, right? If you only got into one school, right? It probably means you really just overreached there and you were trying for too many difficult schools um, and you didn't really give yourself the opportunity to have as many choices available to consider, okay? So having more backup schools, having more target schools is good because not only can you shop around, so to speak, in terms of like finding a better situation, but you can also compare financial aid or scholarship offers, right? You could actually pay to have more schools that you got accepted to, okay? 
So, and in some cases, you may even be able to compare and literally shop around. You can contact admissions offices and basically say, hey, you know, I really want to go to your school, and but this school is offering me maybe a better financial aid package. Is there anything you can do, right? So not all financial aid offices will comply or, or honor that request, but some do, right? If they accepted you, they kind of want you. And if you do this early in the process, there is some wiggle room. There is an opportunity for you to get perhaps a better financial aid situation or maybe even be considered for some scholarships, right? Okay, next. Uh, the essay, of course, since we're talking about the application, you cannot do that without talking about the actual essays that you write on the common application, right? So I'd like to say that your essay is your face to the admissions office, right? So in many cases, the admissions officer never gets to meet you in person, and all they ever see of you is what is on the essay, right? So they really try to make like a secondhand, I guess, picture of you based on what you say on the essay itself. Okay, so um, with the relative decline of standardized testing, the essays have gotten more and more important. And like I said, this is your face to the admissions office. The college admissions process uh, is a very, I guess it's a very human process is what I'd like to call it, right? So these days with AI, most people think, oh, admissions is very sort of like automated, which is not, right? Uh, it's still very much a human and subjective process, right? It's more art than science, as, as people say, right? So there's a lot of decision making. There's a lot of talking behind closed doors. There's a lot of, you know, basically, you know, just, I guess, deliberation and debate even uh, within a committee, right? So if you can really make a connection with the admissions people who are reading your file, they can advocate for you, right? They can basically say why you think, why they think you deserve to get in, right? So if you can really kind of connect with them or really impress them in the essay, it can really tremendously help your chances, okay? Next, these are the topics that are on the Common App. Uh, it didn't really change from last year, actually, right? So interestingly enough, uh, if you were to take a look at these, uh, some of the more popular prompts that I think people have written about, um, writing about a challenge or obstacle, very popular, right? Um, an accomplishment or event or realization that sparked your growth. That's another popular one. And of course, prompt seven is topic of your choice, right? So these are some of the more popular ones. Now, the thing though, is that admissions people don't honestly really care <laughs> which prompt. These are meant as guidelines. To be honest, I've told students in the past, just write your essay. Don't worry too much which prompt you're picking. Because to be honest, you can either pick prompt seven or even prompt one, technically. You can write on anything, right? Because you're supposed to just share your story. So any essay that you write about can honestly be made to fit a prompt one, if you think about it, okay? So don't really worry about, oh, am I picking the right prompt? Is this the best prompt to pick, right? That's really, really not important at all, right? What's more important is you focus on the story that you wanna share about yourself and you're able to highlight certain traits or qualities that you know are gonna be impressive to the admissions people, okay? Next, so this is my tip. These are my tips for how to necessarily excel in the essay portion, right? So the first one here is to think strategically, right? So a good essay highlights certain qualities or virtues that colleges seek in their incoming freshman class. So oftentimes colleges these days are very big on what they call a character, right? They want people who will add to their community, people who are ethical and outstanding people who will be able to kind of like, you know, really raise or elevate, you know, the, the level of their community, right? So um, one of the things to keep in mind there is you might want to think of like, okay, so what does that mean? What can I showcase about myself that portrays me in a very favorable light? Uh, oftentimes what I've asked students to do even is, is take a look at, uh, if you looked um, online, there's a list of certain qualities or traits that uh, uh, teacher recommenders or counsel recommenders are asked to rate you on. If you're just really not sure what to focus on, that could be a good sort of brainstorming uh, exercise to take a look at the qualities that are highlighted on that recommendation. This is when the Common App used to be submitted in on, on paper, right? Or there was a paper version that you can download. But they still have that list online, right? So you can find that, uh, and it'll give you a way of checking what qualities or traits that colleges are looking at, right? Next is accentuate your strengths. Take the time to assess what your strengths are and then craft an essay that highlights those strengths. Okay. So if you feel like one of your best traits is that you're very innovative and creative, right? You love building or making things, right? So try to focus that on an essay. Try to maybe uncover why you're that type of person, right? 
were you a little bit of a tinkerer when you were growing up? Did you like to dismantle things, right? So maybe there's a story to say about that. Uh, or maybe you were just a very uh, compassionate and caring person, right? You volunteer a lot. You've always grown up like having a soft spot in your heart for people who are hurting or kind of like, you know, down for any reason. Uh, and that's definitely something that you pride yourself on. Then of course, build an essay around that. Really try to make sure that that highlights that aspect of who you are as a person on your essay, okay? Next, make sure that you also strategically plan what you're gonna say in the personal statement with what you might write about later on in the supplemental essays. Uh, for some of you, if you start looking at the college list, many of them may ask, oh, why are you interested in studying this major at our school? If you wrote your entire personal statement on why you're interested in your major, then in, in many cases, you might end up just saying the same thing for your supplemental essays. So you may want to plan it out and think of what you might say in the personal statement that's more of a character piece, something that focuses more on your overall qualities rather than, let's say, your intellectual interest in your major. I mean, you can mention that maybe if it ties into the trait or the quality that you're trying to mention, but I think it's better for you to go ahead and separate the two and make the personal statement more of personal narrative about certain qualities that you want to showcase and then have the, I guess, the backstory for why you got interested in your major and save that for supplemental essays, which you probably have to write quite a few, right, on uh, depending on the number of colleges that you're applying to. Okay, but most importantly, I, I do urge all of you to be yourselves in this essay, right? Admissions people have gotten really good at spotting a fake, be it if you used chat GPT or any other AI, or maybe having someone else write your essay, right? That's not a good idea. Or in, in some cases, it's just you trying to be someone you're not in the essay. I think that's also pretty transparent. If, if say for instance, it just doesn't feel very convincing or it feels very contrived, uh, college people, uh, college admissions people have gotten really adept at spotting those types of essays. Okay, so really just make sure that the essay is true to who you are. And sometimes you may want to ask people who are closest to you, right? So your parents, maybe your best friend, and try to see if, if when they read the essay, does this sound like you? This is sound like the, the you that they've known for many years, right? So this is definitely something that you can use as a springboard for some ideas, but don't feel like you have to write what they say all the time. You do have that freedom to go ahead and write a story that you know to be true of who you are personally, okay? All right, so we mentioned supplemental essays. One of the key things right now, though, is that there are a lot more varieties of supplemental essays, especially after uh, last year, because last year in June, the Supreme Court ruled that colleges can no longer use affirmative action. And one of the things that they basically decided is that the supplemental essays can be used to go ahead and explore issues of race and identity um, in the college application process, not necessarily because you just checked off a box that said you were a certain race, but rather if those experiences of being a certain race or kind of uh, gender identity, for instance, are things that uniquely shape who you are and what you've profoundly gone through, uh, or maybe if you face some sort of adversity, you can write about those in your college essays uh, especially because they've now designed certain supplemental prompts that actually do ask you specifically about this. So I'll give you some examples here, right? So for instance, uh, there's one that simply asks you about your background and contributions, okay? So, so here's some variants of this, like Harvard's and Stanford's. So Harvard will ask, Harvard has long recognized the importance of enrolling a diverse student body. How will the life experiences that shape who you are today enable you to contribute to Harvard? Notice, by the way, it, it does say life experiences. It doesn't necessarily say things about your culture or your ethnicity. Um, so life experiences is really broad, right? So they're talking about diversity in the broadest possible sense. So let's say you don't really have much to write about in terms of your culture because it's not really a big part of your identity or your life experience. You can write about your passions for different things because let's say, for example, you're really big in terms of volunteering and helping out your local community. That could be something you can add to a, you know, to a school. Or if you're very passionate about music, right, um, that can also be something that you would add to the diversity of the school, right? So def definitely think long and hard, uh, but I would definitely align these to things that you know to be things that you've already contributed to in your school. Because the chances are, if you've contributed in some meaningful ways based on certain activities or based on your passions in your high school, you most likely be able to make a very similar contribution at the universities you're applying to, be it a Harvard or Stanford, okay? 
Next, uh, some colleges might ask you whether or not you face some sort of adversity. So Columbia has a prompt that asks here, please describe a barrier or obstacle you faced and discuss the personal qualities, skills, or insights you developed as a result. Now, it can be made to write an essay about race, but it doesn't need to be, right? So many of us face some form of adversity. Now, of course, some bigger than others, but it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you didn't have some like catastrophic life event that happened to you or your family, that there's nothing you can write about this. Sure, some people will, but to be honest, even like smaller challenges or adversities can be very instructive with the type of person you are, as long as you focus on how you dealt with that adversity, okay? So, you know, I, there are very many different life examples you can think of, right? Even let, let's say, for instance, a conflict with a best friend, okay? Or maybe a disagreement with a teacher that could work its way into like an obstacle, right? Uh, or some family situation. It doesn't necessarily have to be a very dramatic situation like a death or anything like that, which obviously if that did happen, that could be something you could write about. But, you know, as long as you reflect on what it is that you've overcome over the last four years, many of us have had to face things in the last few, few years that, you know, we just, you know, can really put a spotlight on our ability to go past certain difficulties, okay? Uh, and next, handling diverse perspectives. So even if, let's say, you don't feel like you personally add to the diversity of the school, right, um, your ability to have an open mind, your ability to engage with people from a whole spectrum of different backgrounds and ideologies can be very, very uh, instructive to a college in terms of how you they think you might fit into the community that they're trying to form, right? So Yale, for example, asks, reflect on a time you discussed an issue important to you with someone holding an opposing view. Why did you find this experience meaningful, right? So, you know, this probably happens to you all the time, right? So especially if you're not a senior now and you're a younger student, definitely knowing that some of these schools write these essays, you could probably already maybe start a journal thinking about things that happen in your daily life. So that two, three, four years down the line when you're finally applying, you're not like, I can't remember a single moment, right? So definitely a good idea. Um, oftentimes our students will have their own diaries or journals about things that they could talk about for college applications down the line. Caltech has a similar version, right? Respect and appreciation for the idea that while we're all members of the same community, the opportunities we've had to develop, showcase, and apply our talents have not been equal, right? So I cut off the rest of that prompt. That doesn't sound like a full prompt to me. But anyway, you get the idea, right? So similar to Yale, right? It's asking you about like having that equal respect for people, no matter how different their opinions might be. Okay, so I guess that's enough for essays for now. Um, another part of the application that's also going to be quite vital is going to be the activity section, right? This is where, interestingly enough, everything that you've been doing for the last three, three and a half years is meant to be condensed in a single page on the common application that doesn't really allow you much room to go ahead and elaborate. So as you can well imagine, there's a little bit of strategy that should go into this in terms of how to necessarily take everything that you've been doing and really try to make sure that the admissions people know the full impact of what you're able to do. So first of all, how do colleges normally evaluate extracurricular activities? So this was a snippet from when I used to do interviews at Harvard ages ago, right? But pretty much what they're doing here is that you don't necessarily see a rating for how many activities you have. It's really more in terms of the level of achievement or accomplishment you've had. So as you can see here, with number one being the highest rating, Number one says national or international recognition, professional potential, or truly unusual achievement, right? So if you really are that exceptional in one or two of your core activities, you should really try to prioritize that as like the first or second activity that you put. Um, of course, uh, number two would be for substantial school-wide, regional or state recognition, or major contribution or leadership, right? So uh, most people who are serious candidates to a place like Harvard, for instance, would get a one or two on this list. If you get a three solid participation, but with that distinction, that doesn't really bode well for your chances, unfortunately. Uh, and of course, if you have little or no participation beyond just being in the classroom and getting grades, you probably don't really have much of a shot, to be honest. Okay. So how does this relate to the actual common application itself? Well, if you're looking at the activity section, first of all, you are allowed... 10 activities in this section. For some of you, you're like, oh, I don't even have 10, 
right? But for some others, it's like, oh my gosh, what do I do with 11, 12, 13, and 14? We'll talk about that in a little bit, okay? Uh, but you are to prioritize which 10 you wanna put on the main activity section, right? And there's a bit of a strategy here in terms of how to word the descriptions to make sure that it's to maximum effect. I oftentimes don't recommend writing in full sentences because you only really get about 150 characters here. So that's not going to be good for you to, you know, you're not going to be able to fit much if you said, for example, here, I have played varsity basketball for the last two years on my school's basketball team. And I'll probably be exceeding 150 characters anyway. And notice, by the way, you didn't really tell me much at that point. I would rather you basically put things like um, varsity captain. Um, you could say like, played power forward, scored 23 points per game, you know, something like that where you can actually be a little bit more specific, um, you know, as much as you can based on the activity that you're, you're putting down here, right? So now keep in mind, uh, we'll also talk about something called the additional information section. So that's at the very end of the, uh, of the common application after you paste it in your essay. There's gonna be a text box of up to 650 words where you can put in more information to elaborate on the stuff that you had earlier, right? So just keep that in mind, right? So how do you prioritize though, which activities they see? Well, I would say in terms of your top three, maybe try to prioritize that first as the ones that you have as your most impressive activities. If you have for sure things that you've done on a national or international level and you've gotten awards or accomplishments for them, that should go in the top three. Also, if you've got, gotten like really advanced work that's related to your major, like research or like a high level internship, that should definitely have you know, upward consideration in terms of putting it at the top. Um, if you had significant leadership at your school, okay? So if you've been founder and president of a club, for example, or you're editor in chief of the school paper, if there are really big activities in your campus and you have a prominent leadership position, those should definitely be at the top of your list or one at the top of your list. Okay. Now, beyond that, you should also prioritize, like, how related is it to my major? How many years have I been participating? As you can see here, it's really just a checkbox to, to, uh, to put down which activities you've been doing for how many years, okay? So keep in mind when you're putting in your things like that, how many hours you've done, um, give yourself the benefit of the doubt. In other words, don't necessarily, let's say it's if you participate in a club, don't just put the one hour for the club if you spend maybe two or three hours during the week doing other things related to your club, like preparing for a meeting or activity, or you guys do things during the weekend. Try to average that out. But on the flip side of things, really avoid the temptation to embellish this too much, right? Because if you're putting way more hours than it seems like reasonable, it's not really going to impress the admissions people, to be honest, right? Especially if they see some red flags, like there are actually way more hours that you're entering than there actually are in the week. That becomes really problematic. Uh, in fact, there was a case, I think there was an article about a student who got uh, their admissions revoked somewhere because they kind of, uh, they effectively considered uh, their activity section as being lying, where they were putting way too many hours. So just keep that in mind. I think it was a student at Stanford, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, next, this is kind of what the additional information section looks like. You will have up to 650 words to go ahead and type in additional things that you want to share with colleges. So I would say this is a good place to use uh, to add more activities if you have more than like 10, like, like I mentioned earlier, or if you really just want to elaborate, which to be fair, if you have one or two main activities where you've been very heavily involved and you go to competitions and stuff, you really won't do it justice with 150 characters. So you really should use the space to really flesh out and elaborate your accomplishments within those core activities. Like, you know, for instance, uh, my daughter does speech and debate. So if she were to enter this in, you don't want to just say, oh, I did speech and debate for four years, right? So you'd want to put in your highlights in terms of your biggest accomplishments, your wins, your speaker awards, and et cetera, right? So just really try to use this space for maximum effect, okay? Um, you can also use this space to go ahead and add links to any sort of online content that you want to share. Hey, if there was a news article on you and your school online paper and you wanted to be able to kind of show, show that off a little bit, sure. I mean, I would put that down for sure, right? Uh, or something like if there is a website that shows you winning an award or something, right? So that's all fair game. Or like for research, right? So if you want to do an external paper for more technical things that you want to share that's related to any research that you've done, I would definitely consider putting that down in the additional information section, okay? 
You can also use this to explain any sort of unusual circumstances, like there's a gap a semester or gap, gap year, or maybe an unusually bad semester where your grades plummeted. You probably want to use this space to explain that as well. Although above all else, please, yes, it, it is 650, very similar to the personal statement length. Do not use this as a place for you to paste it in another essay, right? Admissions people hate it, right? Just based on what I've heard. <laughs> um, so de definitely don't use that to spring an essay on them that they weren't planning to read, okay? They probably would just gloss over it or not even read it at all, okay? And then at that point, you just wasted space that could you could have used to share information that could have been helpful in other ways, okay? All right, so what about testing? Of course, there is a testing section on the Common Application where you can put in your test results. So for the most part, you can actually pick which tests you're gonna be reporting, be it SAT or ACT, uh, or IB or AP scores, or if you're taking like a foreign language or, or a test of English as a foreign language, like TOEFL or the IELTS test, you can put those scores in here, right? So things to keep in mind, many schools still allow students to self-report their scores using the Common App. So you can actually go ahead and just put your scores for the SAT or ACT here, and you're not really required to send in your official SAT or ACT scores until after you've actually gotten accepted and choose to attend that school. Although that doesn't go for all schools. Some schools you actually have to check to see because some schools may actually want you to go ahead and submit the official scores. So check with each school on your list, okay? Uh, next, if you're applying to some schools that will accept what's known as a super score, what that basically means is some schools will take the higher of your two sections on the SAT, English and math, and then mix and match it to form a higher total score, or in the ACT with all four subjects, they'll just take your highest subject, right? And then add it together. If you know that certain schools on your list do that, you can submit multiple scores rather than just send, sending in your single highest sitting, right? So you do have control over this, right? So uh, colleges don't really automatically get access to your scores. They only see what you really report to them. So both in both the ACT and the College Board website, you can control which test scores colleges have access to. So just keep that in mind, okay? And then also don't forget to add your AP scores here as well, including those that you have not taken yet, right? So they wanna see which ones you're planning to take because for the most part, AP scores aren't really a huge part of the equation in terms of you getting into the college, but it's gonna be really important in terms of you getting some college credits. So if you want to be able to earn those credits, make sure that they're aware of it so that by the time you attend the school and um, they send it to your regist their registrar's office, you're getting proper credit for the tests that you are gonna send later on. Okay, now one of the key trends of the last couple of years is that more and more colleges are now requiring the SAT again. It used to be just a small number of schools like Georgia Tech and MIT, but now about half the IVs are now requiring the SAT again. Uh, as are a lot of prominent other schools like Hopkins, Stanford, right? MIT, of course, I already mentioned. Caltech is now requiring it again. That's a total 180, in my opinion, because Caltech, for a good chunk of COVID, or the COVID era, right, the last uh, four years or so, have been pretty much like the UCs. They've been test blind. They don't even want your, they, they didn't even want your scores. Now they've kind of flipped to the opposite direction, which is kind of why there's not a reported 75th percentile SAT or ACT here, because they haven't really been reporting it because they didn't look at it, right? Now, I've also put, though, the 75th percentile SAT and ACT scores for the schools that do require them. Why the 75th percentile? If you heard any of my seminars before, it's because the 75th percentile is typically the score that you'd want to be competitive, right? Especially if you're applying in your Asian, right? So because Asian students have had historically higher SAT and ACT averages, this is effectively like the Asian average. This is the score you need to be competitive for these schools. Okay, so a big question that's still relevant these days is should I submit my SAT, right? Uh, or ACT, right? So many schools are in fact still test optional despite the fact that many of those schools on that list are now bringing back the requirement. So, but before you decide whether or not to go test optional, I really want you to consider how strong are you just looking at your grades alone? Because if your grades aren't necessarily perfect or you kind of shied away from taking the most difficult classes, 
you may want to consider having an SAT score, especially if it's in the 70th percentile, because it could serve as a counterbalance to weaker grades. Now, it won't completely make up for weaker grades, to be honest, right? Because if you got like five Bs, even if you got like a 36 on the ACT, it's not going to make those five Bs disappear. You're still going to be at a slight disadvantage compared to other students with a better GPA, but at least the good test score will sort of give them something else, some other data point to consider in terms of your academic potential, okay? So if you think you can excel for the SAT or ACT, then you really should consider preparing for it early, right? So that you can at least see whether or not it's something that can help your case, right? If it turns out you're not really good at SAT or ACT and it's very difficult to, for you to raise your score no matter how hard you try, you just do your best in terms of what you managed to do for your grades. In that case, you know, if your grades weren't all that perfect, obviously you wanna make, make sure you finish with a very strong junior year. But you also want to try to maybe see if you can supplement that by taking outside college courses, even if it's online, right, to really help bolster your, your overall transcript strength. Okay. Also, keep in mind for testing, the latest test scores that most colleges will accept is an October SAT or ACT for early action or early decision and a December score in most cases, I guess, for regular decision, depending on the school's actual deadlines. Okay, so a quick note about recommendation letters, which is the other major part of the actual Common App itself. So for recommendation letters, it's important to note that the Common App can be used to assign your rec letter writers for some schools. It'll just be based on what your, school, uh, your school's policy is. So once you enter in your school on the Common App, it will tell you either to have this option here where you can click invite to your teacher and counselor, or it'll have a description here that your school uses some sort of external website like Navion's or School Links or some variant of that, right? Uh, so in that case, you wouldn't need to assign them here, but there are also gonna be some schools that allow anywhere from, well, I mean, either no outside recommenders or up to three. I've even seen four, I guess, in some rare cases. Uh, these are people who are gonna be like coaches or people that know you from your activities outside of school, perhaps maybe like a, a arts or music teacher, um, clergy, right? A pastor or a priest, for instance, could be someone else you can have to write a rec letter uh, or an employer. If you've gotten a summer job or something like that, that could also be viable, okay? So uh, one of the things I tell students though is that it's always a good idea to make sure that you've at least gotten a heads up or given a heads up to your recommender that you're gonna add them here it's kind of really weird and jarring if they weren't expecting you, or even worse, if you didn't even ask them yet to write a rec recommendation letter and you click invite teacher and they got a link for co a college board, or I'm sorry, for the Common App. Um, if, if that's the case, then they might not know, they might think it's spam, or they might not know that you were willing to ask for it, or, or you were planning to ask them for a recommendation letter. It's always best to be upfront with them and to be timely with them so that they're not ambushed by a recommendation letter request. And oftentimes it's a good rule of thumb to ask them at least a full month before you're planning to submit your first application. Next up, which teachers do you wanna ask? Well, normally we want you to prioritize your 11th grade teachers. And if you can help it, hopefully from your, your hardest classes, be it your IB or AP teachers or an honors class, for instance, now, 10th or 11th grade teachers can work as well, but it'd be better if maybe you've had them for another year or a prior year, especially if it's like 12th grade, right? Because by the time you're you're having them submit the recommendation letter, they'll maybe only have known you for like, I don't know, like a couple of months, right? So I, I guess though, if you've had your 12th grade teacher earlier, like you had them in 10th grade or 11th or 9th grade, then it probably will be about even to a, an 11th grade teacher, I guess, in that case. Uh, if possible, aim to have a balance between one STEM and one non-STEM teacher, although the only schools that really require that balance these days, if I recall, are going to be MIT and Caltech. Um, but if you have multiple teachers that can write you a good one, it, it's not a bad idea to have a little bit of balance with the recommendations anyway. But above all else, though, still strive to pick the two best teachers. Uh, this is only a luxury if you have like three or four teachers that can equally write you strong rec letters, right? But if your two best rec letters are going to be STEM, go for it. Unless, like I said, you're planning to apply to Caltech or MIT. Okay. Now, lastly, cultivating a good relationship with your teachers and counselor is vital to your success in college applications. So, you know, be aware of this and really try your best to get to know them as the school year progresses. 
right? So it's only really September now. If you're a junior, you have plenty of time to really get to know your teachers pretty well and really try to impress them, right? Now, impressing them doesn't always just mean the grade, right? So if you can uh, contribute to classroom discussions, if you can show real genuine interest in the subject matter that they're teaching, those are good ways to really get the attention of your teacher. Okay, now beyond the Common App, we spoke a lot about the Common App today, but uh, there are other schools that may have their own system applications. You've already heard me talk about the UC application system. If you're applying to the UCs, you won't find them in the Common App. Uh, some other schools, for instance, like MIT and Georgetown, are not on the Common App, so they'll be there. They'll have their own application systems as well, which would be pretty similar. Although MIT's is really kind of honestly antiquated, which is ironic considering they're one of the most innovative tech schools in the country, right? Um, there is a rival, or was a rival, it's not really that used anymore, called the Co a Coalition Application, which really tried to sort of like, I guess, compete in the marketplace with a Common App. But given that the Common App has kind of remained the dominant application system now for college admissions, Coalition has been relegated to just a smaller list of schools. But in theory, if you had 20 schools already, you could use the Coalition app, but I don't recommend it uh, just because a lot of counselors feel like it's unnecessary and they might be annoyed that you're having them fill out yet another application system if it's really not necessary. They would probably encourage you to just trim down your list. Okay. All right. So with that, um, that's the main part of the app, uh, the seminar. I do want to talk to you a little bit about HS2 Academy, though, and what we've been doing over the last couple of decades that have really helped out our students. First of all, we have a really tried and true system. Uh, that really works with and evaluates the strengths of our students, right? So it starts with the first step of really developing individualized strategies to make sure our students really know what their key strong points are and how to really maximize those to be able to get the most uh, out of their high school experience. We also really want to help them decide the schools and majors that they're going to be applying with uh, and also what to do with their activities profile, right? How to really amplify their resumes and the activity section like we talked about, okay? Um, I have also mentioned to you that I was a former Harvard interviewer, right? So one of the key things that we do uh, help our students with is how to navigate the interview process, which is a vital part of the application. And of course, a, a good chunk of the actual application work itself for many of our counselors will be to help students work with and polish personal statements and their uh, supplemental essays as well. Okay, uh, HS2 does also offer financial aid guidance. We do have partnerships with college financial planners who can help you uh, put together your, you know, your best strategy for trying to get the, the most out of financial aid pro uh, process as well. And of course, we're proud uh, that every single year we do help students get into the most prestigious schools. But like I always say in these seminars, we're just as proud of students who did get into schools that are maybe less sort of like high profile and less higher ranked, as long as it's able to be like something that maximized or exceeded what they thought they were able to do. It's really all about maximizing a student's potential for us, okay? Now, beyond counseling, which is of course, you know, our, our company's, you know, strongest point that we've been doing for many years, we also have outstanding teachers who teach our test prep classes. Uh, two of our superstar teachers at HS2, we have Adam Mua, who's our head instructor, graduate from Stanford, and Dr. Gina Henry, who uh, has a PhD in education from Michigan, but also graduated with an undergrad degree from UPenn, right? So um, overall, HS2 also has its own uh, nonprofit wing called Compassionate Scholars. So we do help our students try to get all these different volunteer opportunities if, say, for example, it's hard to come by at their local community or at school, right? So students can partner up with other HS2 students to launch their own nonprofit projects. And this is a really good way for them to really stand out compared to other students who are applying for the same schools. Okay, so with that, 